Hey everybody, it's Lauren Delisa Coleman back with another episode of the Inside Series here at Filmio. We're still doing a few post Bentonville interviews and this one I cannot wait to be able to bring you. I am lucky enough to have with me the subject and executive producer of a very hot film um, called Deconstructing Karen. And we just love her because she's taking out time, not only after the festival, but she's in the middle of a move too. So you'll see like movers and everything. Um, <laughs> she is like really holding it down as you know, all women do multitasking. So Sarah, thank you so much for talking with us. Um, can you give the viewers, first of all, this is how we always start with the Inside Series, um, of a brief synopsis of Deconstructing Karen? Sure. Um, I am first generation Indian American and my partner at Race to Dinner is uh, a Black American. And we both live in Denver. I'm about to move to Virginia. But we started Race to Dinner a couple of years ago. And what that is, is Regina, my partner and I, um, have dinners with white women all over the world, um, digitally and in real life. And it's always eight to 10 white women. And the whole thing is for us to help them to see and acknowledge their own white supremacy and racism. That's it, in a nutshell. It's radically honest conversations about their racism over basically dinner and drinks. And Deconstructing Karen is a documentary about our work. So it actually captures one full dinner that we had in the summer of 2019 in Denver. Um, you know, very, very loaded, right? Not just like a, a kind of gardening group, right? You guys really decided to go for it. How did you decide to do this, number one, Syra? And what made you think that women would actually pay for this? And what type of women do you actually attract? I'm like so curious about this. Sure. Um, I ran for Congress in 2018 and I primaried a super liberal white woman Democrat here in Colorado. And basically my whole platform was anti-racism and, and acknowledge that's, that's America's foundational principle until and unless we acknowledge that we get nowhere. And so um, every time I spoke, there was a line out the door of white ladies, you know, again, super liberal Democrat white ladies, um, waiting to talk to me, not to give them, not to give me support, but to tell me, not me, you've got me wrong, not all white women. And they wanted to have lunch and they wanted to have dinner. And I did it all because I was courting votes. I was running for office. I lost. And um, thereafter I got sort of, I was put on the hit list of Breitbart, Fox News. I made sort of the whole rounds of right-wing Nazi media. And so I kind of, I grew a bigger platform as a result of that. And Regina, um, my partner worked on my campaign. So she saw all of this the whole time. And then sometime in like November, one of her white women friends, former white women friends, I had made a comment about Beto O'Rourke being a white savior, which apparently was a straw that broke that woman's back, you know? Um, and I said, I would have also voted for Beto O'Rourke and he's a white savior. Um, she goes to Regina and says, I'm done with Syrah. Syrah hates all white people, but will you set up a lunch for us? So Regina calls me and I said, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm tired of doing that, wasting my time with these white people. But you know what? I've got a crew of white women who've already asked, if you come with me and have dinner with me and we'll invite all of these ladies and sit down in one fell swoop, I'll do it. So we did. And that dinner was like white woman, the Broadway musical. I mean, crying, you know, anger, like stomping okay. around. Not Broadway um, musical. Sarah, you are totally, a pack up. Totally. It was that. And so we posted about it on Facebook and it just went viral. It totally went viral. And Regina and I were just, uh, you know, it, it was just incredible. And, and what everyone said is, I want to do a dinner like that. I want to come to a dinner like that. And we were like, you know what? If I've been doing if, if by the way, black and brown people have been doing this their whole lives, our whole lives for free. And we we're like, let's do it. Let's, let's do it. We'll charge them for our labor. And Regina came up with the, the title Race to Dinner, and that's what happened. I just think it's so fascinating on so many different levels um, because you just wouldn't think people would pay for this. But then again, maybe they would, depending on the age group and like kind of the, the educational background. Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm assuming this is a certain demographic of Caucasian female. This is not somebody from, you know, the Adirondacks or somebody whose husband his and the whole family line has been, been clan members and they're deep, deep, deep in rural South. You're talking about, I would assume, rather well-educated 
um, more than likely urban Caucasian women who are looking for greater answers or dialogue around this and just don't have the social network that is diverse enough to have such an exchange. Yes or no? I'm very curious. I mean, look, it's, it's, I'll be very clear here. All white women, all white women. So the, the so no matter socioeconomic women, background. No, 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 no. I'm just saying all white women are mired in white supremacy, right? So who are, uh, who yeah, has, I'm talking about maybe your, yeah, 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 yeah. totally. Uh, I understand. Um, Especially who, already with $2,500, that is already uh, kind of, I guess, a, a major like barrier for many people, black, white, and different gender, all genders to be able to access. So you're only going to have a certain type of person in the room, correct? Yeah. So it's mostly white liberal women. So yes, high college educated white liberal women, frankly, the white women of America who run the show. These are the women who possess the most power, the most privilege. And um, yeah, that's who we have. I mean, it's it's Democrats for the most part. It's progressives at the at the dinner um, in deconstructing Karen that you'll see. Um, there are a few Republican Trump supporters. And I think everybody who sees the movie is quite surprised about how that shakes out. Right, because you you might think one thing and then it might be another without we don't give want to give too much away. Um, and again, without giving too much away, what's maybe some of the most surprising thing other than, you know, maybe stereotypes, what have you, that you have seen come out of these dinners, whether it might be reaction or question or beliefs um, that was, you know, maybe captured in the film or not. Sure. Um you know, we see, when I say white women, the Broadway musical, that's every dinner. I mean, it really is. It's, it's like every dinner is a little bit different, obviously, but every dinner is very much also the same. And so the dinner that you'll see in the movie is very much, I mean, people have asked us this, oh my God, was that dinner different? Like, no, it's very much the same as, as every dinner. I think the thing that surprises me, because at this point, my expectations of white people is quite low. And so when there is actually a, a substantive shift in a white woman from the dinner, that's when I'm surprised. I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, or a, a shift by a white woman who's seen the movie or, you know, has read an advanced copy of our book that's coming out in November. So you never know. I mean, just like in the movie, you never know which white woman is going to actually have a shift. Um, political affiliation has nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm, Regional mm -hmm stuff has nothing to do with it. Religion has nothing to do with it. And so um, we've had that. I mean, I met a huge white woman um, wellness influencer on my flight from Denver to Toronto last month going to hot docs. Um, she has 2.2 million followers. Her handle is the bird's papaya. She has a podcast. Um, she never really, you know, posts anything about race or anti-racism. Everything is body positivity, uh, health, beauty, wellness. I sent her a link to the movie thinking she'll never watch it. And if she does, she'll absolutely hate it. And two weeks later, she emailed us and said, oh, my God, I want to have you all on, our pod on my podcast. So I was shocked. I was surprised, very pleasantly surprised. But that's happening. That is happening. Our work is working. Um, not on everyone, obviously, but it's working. Well, I think it's really fascinating because obviously outside of, you know, an academic environment and more particularly, you know, university level, there is nowhere to be able to speak about something which is so very important. And so I think that that is, you know, it's just fascinating that you've been able to, to capture it, at least in this manner. Right. Um, so tell me how you decided to then take this and put it onto film. And let me just also say one other thing before you answer this. You started this in 2019, your the race to dinner, which like how like crazy perfect timing because then all of this would happen then in 2020 about like Karen. And so it was the perfect, you know, title then for the film, correct? Because obviously that was not, you know, kind of your, your thinking or even in the the lexicon, as we'd say, you know, of society about Karen's back in 2019. But you guys had the chance to like kind of ramp up with the in real life dinners and then take it forward and further and then into film. So that's just like really fascinating your timing, no? 
well, racism has been around forever, right? So I think this movie could have been made 200 years ago. It can hopefully, I mean, sadly enough, I think it could be made 200 years from now. If but humanity very is still much existing. top of mind thinking though right now. And with, you know, the, the slang terms and all that, I think it's really just uh, a very interesting time and one that's yeah. more open, I think, to having yeah. a discussion than it would have been much more before. Yeah. Sure. I mean, we, we also didn't come up, the title didn't, the movie was shot and, and, you know, it was in full swing and we didn't have a title yet. So the title kind of came a little bit later. Okay. So tell me a little bit about shooting it. Did you actually, um, you know, have any filmmaking spirits prior? How did you actually, you know, kind of bring all this together, the team, et cetera? I'm, I'm just interested to, to hear about that because Anna Paquin, whose name we actually haven't heard in a while, is you know, the, one of the exec producers on this. So how did it all come together, Syra? Sure. Um, a white woman by the name of Patty Ivan Specht, who is the producer director of Deconstructing Care and had been following my work on Facebook for a while um, and through Congress and all of that. And when I posted about this dinner, she reached right that day, I think she reached out to me and said, um, can I talk to you about doing a movie? She's a documentary filmmaker. and we had a call that day and she said, I've been noodling on this for years, just watching how white women I've been doing that before race to dinner, you know, I've been doing this work for a while. And so um, she said, I've just been noodling on how can we um, capture your work? And then when you posted about this dinner, it hit me. This is it. This is the vehicle through which mm. we capture the work. So Regina and I said, sure, if you want to make a film, make a film thinking there's no way she's going to make a film. Right. By the way, like within a week, she reached out and she said, okay, I'm, I'm putting together a shoot for summer. Let's get a dinner together for that. So we did. That's, I mean, we, we got a dinner together for that and she did it. She just came and she shot it and she interviewed us throughout that year. And um, that was all her, you know, that was all her. So she assembled her team. She does this for a living. So she did it. And um, so then she know, has a relationship with Anna or Anna no, no, came no, no, a no, different no. way. No. So um, when the movie was finished this year, I was put in touch with Anna through a friend and sent her the movie and she watched it and she loved it. And she said, how, like, how can I get involved? That's, that's what happened with Anna Pepman. Very, very interesting. So then now tell me about the, the journey to Bentonville. Yeah, sure. Um, so we are just in the process of submitting. We just started sort of the film festival thing. We had our world premiere at Hot Docs in Toronto right. last month and we are just finishing today is what Thursday today we just had a theatrical run a week-long theatrical run in Toronto um until today and we were invited to Bentonville so we decided sure let's do our U.S. premiere at Bentonville and we've got other film festivals lined up um for the fall and the winter and I think that's what we're going to do we're going to keep showing the movie around the world uh via film festivals as we consider and contemplate what you know, bigger global streaming distribution looks like. Very interesting. So um, Gina Davis introduced this film at Bentonville, her own festival, as you guys know. How did that come about? Because she also is a fan of the film. Um, I don't, you know, I think that they, we were, yeah, we were just told that that she would be doing that, which is great. So we Right, we really because she doesn't introduce that. every film yeah. and not yeah. any film as yeah. well, even at her own festival. So yeah. I was just wondering was how that, that came about. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about um, reaction to the film while you were there, like kind of boots on the ground. Well, blown away by the reaction. I mean, the Q&A ran over and then when it ended, we had tons of people who stayed after to talk to us. I think for me and Regina both, I can speak on Regina's behalf, the three in real life showings, we've had two in Toronto, one here. The most exciting um, reactions have been from Black, Asian, Latino, Indigenous people. And it's been, thank you. Um, thank you for doing this. It, it's in 75 minutes. We want white people to see what we've been saying for years. Um, lots of laughter, lots of clapping, lots of snapping. Um, an Indian woman was there, which for me was amazing. She was visiting her son from India. She doesn't speak English. She speaks Hindi. I don't speak Hindi. And through her son, she translated, um, thank you. I never thought in my life I'd ever see someone who looks like me doing this work. And um, the stories in the movie about my mom just apparently really warmed her. So it was it was incredible. The, the reaction has been incredible. We did, you know, 
we just got this. I guess a white guy was at the, um, I'll read this to you, we, was at the festival uh-huh. and we got this first hate review, which is pretty funny. He said, deconstructing Karen is, quote, deconstructing Karen is the most disgusting thing that I've ever seen. And I felt sick to my stomach throughout the course of my viewing. I didn't feel sick for the reasons that Jackson and Rao want the world to, but because of how dangerous and racist this film is. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. What do you think are the dangers of such a film or capturing this particular exchange? Because we tend to think that one exchange is indicative of all others or all women or whatever. And that's why I was asking you, I think a bit more about what type of women, woman comes here, right? Because this may or may not be representative of the whole, right? This is what academics spend their life on, how many samples you need to be able to say, you know, X, Y, Z thing is pretty much like this. It holds true across, you know, the board. So um, picking up on what he said, what do you think about that? If it's even possible to diverse, divorce yourself from you know, what you see to be, be true and what you live and I live every day, but let's pretend it's not us. And to be able to step back for a moment and say, is there, is there any danger in kind of capturing such people with such views? There's always danger. There's always a musical. (laughs) There's always danger in telling the truth, right? There's always danger in telling the truth and a foundational principle of white supremacy is feigned ignorance of it. So let's pretend that it's not here. It's not the elephant in the room. It's the room. It's the house. It's the city. It's the village. It's the sun. It's the sky. It's everywhere, right? And we have to pretend that that's not the case. White supremacy and the concomitant anti-Blackness. That's the hierarchy, right? And it's anti-Blackness, white supremacy, and the rest of us are in between. And if we pretend that that's not it, it continues you know, blissfully continues. So sure, I mean, people who don't want to tell the truth, books are being banned right now. Books are being banned. There's a whole onslaught, you know, there's a whole war against the truth right now. And sure, it's dangerous to tell the truth. We get hate mail every single second, every single second of every single day. I mean, I got vile pictures texted to me on my actual phone a couple of weeks ago. Um, people threatening, you'll see in the movie, like some of the actual language that we get, people threatening our families, our children, our grandchildren. It is dangerous. to live like that though, Syrah? Does that make you more um, aggressive and more hard than maybe you were before? If you look back at yourself as when you were 17? I don't know. I always wonder what it is like for many people who we look at, you know, so-and-so has been doxxed or this happens or that happens. It has to affect you in a, a psychosocial level, Mo- removing race, removing gender, you're a human being. So how, how do you manage that every day? It's not awesome, but I think I've come to, you know, there are times that are better and worse. And there's times when we get like inundated, like in a span of, it's called storming. It's an actual process by which Nazis do this within like a 24, 36 hour period of time. You'll, I'll get DMs, I'll get texts, I'll get calls. I, you know, it's like, to make you feel that you're under attack. When that happens, it's not awesome. But sadly enough, I'm kind of used to it. And so are, like, I have lots of friends who are anti-racist activists and we all get it. White people get it, white anti-racist activists, black, brown, you know. Look, nobody is safe. If I don't know if you saw this video of the LAPD body slamming actress and activist Jody Sweeten over the weekend, um, who, by the way, we just had a call with yesterday and she's coming on board alongside uh, us in a, like an advisory board capacity for Deconstructing Karen because she also loved the movie. She saw it two weeks ago. So we're definitely building a cool cadre of, of people, but like no one's safe. If you're standing up for what's right, nobody is safe. And I asked her too, I said, how are you? I mean, she's in her, you know, that, that video has gone fully globally viral. I asked her how she felt and she said, I feel great. I got back up and I'm going to do it again this weekend. I mean, at some point, you you know you're doing something right if you're having this kind of response from the powers that be, the institutional oppressors are coming for you, you're doing something right. Um, and maybe getting closer to wrapping up, what do you think is different from the vibe of today and the work that you and others are doing that might be different from, in my opinion, when it was really crazy, back in the early 60s, late, late 50s. And then before that, when my grandmother, you know, was alive, right? You know, people say that it's, it's really tough now, and it's horrible and whatever. And I don't, don't get me wrong, I, I get that. 
I'm not about to be slammed. I'll be the first one, you know, to be like, no. Um, but I think, you know, we, we can't, we can't turn away from the fact that people were, you know, hung, burned, et cetera, et cetera. Prior, you know, I, I really am wondering how today's activists balance, balance that view out and make certain that there is not, I don't know, I guess an overcompensation of maybe righteousness or something like this, when you know that you stand on the shoulders of those who are willing to go toe to toe. And like I said, I know I stand on their shoulders and I, I would be, yes, very, very much concerned about sitting at a counter and what would happen to me back in the day. These people were war, I mean, real true warriors in a major sense. And so I'm wondering how, how you see your, your work within, I guess, what will be a long legacy of dialogue, activism, whatever one might say. Look, Regina and I say this all the time. We are a tiny little speck on this little timeline, on this massive gargantuan timeline. And she says this in the movie. She says this in the movie. Regina says, um, you know, if people say Martin Luther King changed everything, and she said, like, if he did, why are we still here today? And I think the reality is we haven't had truth and reconciliation in this country. Our country's history is genocide of indigenous people, stolen land from indigenous people, genocide and slavery of African people, right? And then rinse, repeat what happened, what has happened to the Chinese, what has happened to Latinos, what has happened to Asians. Like, look, the entire Homeland Department of Homeland Security, ICE, all these things were created because to combat people who look like me. That happened right after September 11, 2001, right? So it's a, it is a centuries long thing. And so where we find ourselves today is the natural conclusion to all of it without truth and reconciliation. The difference right now to me, and I just got off a call with a bunch of folks about this from any other time in, in history in the US is the guns. So now that, now that you know, basically every white person has armed themselves out of fear of black, indigenous, Asian, you know, Latino people, um, that's different. That is a qualitative difference from any other time in this history is the guns. Look at what's happening in this country with guns. I, That's you know, it's, I don't even have to really look very far. Just a few hours ago, I was looking on Twitter and a mother pushing her baby. Got shot in the head I on mean, the Upper East Side. It's like, yeah. wow, do I go outside today? Do I not? Um, exactly. Really, exactly. Really, so that's really, that's really the different. one one difference. And the other one, I would say, is institutional, complete and utter um, illegitimacy of the institutions. So now we can see that the, the federal courts are illegitimate. What what are the what is Congress doing? I mean, Congress is an illegitimate institution. What the hell is Joe Biden doing? Nothing. So um, this is what this is what happens. You know, we've got Nazis, and we're and we've got basically Nazis fighting the Nazis. Joe Biden not doing anything in this moment. How is that different? from people actively trying to end humanity on the planet. And he's not doing anything. He's fighting fire with spit. And so I think that there's a real sense that we don't have anyone fighting for us. We don't have anyone fighting for us. And it's really scary. That coupled with the guns makes this an extremely scary time. But no, I wouldn't argue that we've always had this country's hate, violence, xenophobia, racism, white supremacy, anti-Blackness. This is now just we've added guns to the equation. Hmm. So let's shift just quickly to your time at Bentonville. What did you think about it overall? Is we had a great to, time. You know, just, not just with your screening, but did you have a chance to see other films, talk with other filmmakers, or were you too quickly in and out? Yeah, so we got in, in the, basically in the middle of the night because we came from Toronto. We had two race to dinner events, actually a race to lunch and a race to dinner, and we hopped a flight and we got in super early in the morning and um, went straight to the filmmaker's lunch, then had our screening, went to that after party. And then I left like first thing in the morning because I had to deal with this move. So I was there ah, for I see. A less, than, less than 24 hours. So you didn't really get to have too much of the vibe, but at least you were there. It was fun though. We had a great time. That's so great. So I guess ideally, and I know that there are many things or one thing which is kind of intangible. So I'm going to ask you to see if you can distill it. What's the one ideal thing that you would love to have an audience take away from your film, Syra, and you now you're not allowed to just say no more racism. Tell the truth. Okay. Tell the truth about yourself. Whatever truth that might be. Yep. Great. So now is the quick time to promo because I don't want to keep you for too long from your move. So I know you have a extensive site for both the film and race to dinner. So that's deconstructingkaren.com, correct? 
race to dinner, the number two, race to dinner.com and deconstructing Karen.com. And then you're also active uh, across social on Instagram, correct? Instagram and Twitter. Same handles or deconstructing? Uh, Karen I, or no? I, no, deconstructing Karen's on Twitter. I'm at race to D on Twitter um, or at my name at, at Twitter. Uh, and yeah, Instagram where we, we've sort of covered everything, race to dinner, deconstructed care. And I'm pretty active on Instagram as well. Great. So you guys, you will know how to follow should you choose to. Sarah, I want to thank you so much. Um, stay safe and do you know, continued success with the film. I love, you know, just, I guess in closing, I love how you decided to select, you know, a beautiful dinner to have what is a very challenging conversation. I'm surprised it's not just around you know, a table in a conference room and that's that because who who could even eat after some of these exchanges start? So I'm sure there's a lot of leftovers. It doesn't sure, always right? look like that. It, it's very, you know, the one we had in Toronto for lunch last week was that we were sitting in someone's backyard eating off of paper, eating sandwiches off of paper. Oh, okay. Because I'm picturing it's different every time. crystal in China every time. No, no, no. Best Sometimes arrangements. it's up to the host. Every It's the host gets to decide what it looks like. Got it. All right. Well, you guys, you have to admit, you've got to be super intrigued from this. Sarah, Sarah any closing comments before we wrap up? Well, I hope everyone sees the movie. I think that, uh, you know, people... People hate this movie. People love this movie, but people do not forget this movie. So I hope everyone will check it out. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. For joining us, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you've enjoyed this interview. We have just a couple of others coming up from the Bentonville Film Festival. So definitely click on the next one. I am Lauren Delisa Coleman for the Inside Series right here at Filmio. Thanks again for watching.